Good evening and welcome to this third ETN lecture in this series, which is co-organized by us and Society of ETNs. Tonight I had the pleasure to invite the Vice Chairman of our board, Michael, Dr. Michael Lindblom from Uppsala. Michael's name is probably most, mostly associated with this book, Lindblom's Red, which is a basic volume on, on Potter's Marks. And actually, Michael has told me that he, at some point, got quite fed up with Potmarks. At least when Penelope Mounser started calling, calling, calling him for Mr. Potmark. Michael has excavated extensively in Colonna on Aina. And where else? Well, he participated in a survey in, in Berbati, which yes. is published in the Institute series, and in Calabria. And tonight's lecture will be deal with an LH3C settlement in the midst of the historical sanctuary. And this was really an excavation in an excavation. And it was also sponsored not only by our main sponsor, the Bank and Jubileums Fund, but also by INSTAP. Yes. So please, Michael. Thank you, Atto. Thank you. Uh, I, I trust you can hear me quite clearly. Um, First of all, I'm very glad to be here tonight, and I extend my thanks to the IGEVS committee for inviting me. Let me tell you that I'm really impressed by the work you've done so far. Your newsletters and the web page of IGEVS is really, really good. I use it, my students use it in Sweden, so keep up the good work. Uh, as Arto said, we're going to have a closer look at the Mycenaean remains in the later sanctuary of Poseidon this evening. And um, I thought we would begin with a short overview of what work we have been doing in the sanctuary very, very briefly to move on to some aspects and function of the Mycenaean remains. So I will guide you first through the through the excavations, and then look at certain aspects relating to these, to these finds. We'll look at the uh, first exploration and what was known about the Mycenaean remains before 2011. Have a look at the excavation in area P1, as we call it during 2011 and 12, and then move on to really the core issue here, the activities in, in this area and the chronology of it. So let's move on. Let's move Athens and move over to Poros. The sanctuary area is situ situated up in the hills on the north to north central part of the island of Calabria. You see it inserted here in this terrain model. It's um, overlooking a natural bay, the Vajonia Bay, and you have a splendid view out over the Saronic Gulf. You see Aegina, you see Methana, you see Solomis in the distance, and of course the southern shores of Attica. You see it here on this image. Uh, <clears throat> the temple, the later temple to Poseidon, is located in this area here. And here is the small Vajonia Bay, where there are, in fact, submerged structures in the water waiting to be investigated. We don't know the periods they encompass, but that's another different story. Uh, am I pushing the wrong button? Samuel Vida and Lena Chelberg, together with their architect Sven Christensen, came to this sanctuary in 1894. They started excavating on a German permit, and they excavated for one season. They were mostly interested in tracing the outlines of the buildings in this area. And they were kind of disappointed because they found that well, there wasn't that much, not, not that much standing ruins to document. Nevertheless, they published this investigation uh, in, 
the following year, and you see them here in, in this image. Sam Vida, Anna Kjellberg. Ingrid Berg, who's here tonight, can tell you everything about these gentlemen since she's writing her dissertation about this first excavation. When these gentlemen were excavating to the east of the sanctuary area, you have here the wall surrounding the archaic temple. This is the so-called Perivolos wall. When Vida and Kjellberg were excavating here, in a fill layer, they encountered some Mycenaean remains. It's very briefly reported on in, in the report. They said that they found some Mycenaean sherds, some figurines, uh, uh, some gold foil, small discs of gold. Uh, and that's about it. When the Swedish Institute resumed <coughs> excavations in this area in 1997, within, this, within the sanctuary, the first trench was opened up here, west of the Perivolos area, adjacent to it. Uh, Berit Wells, the former director, and Arthur, who's here, they thought that this might be a convenient place to start an investigation by <coughs> investigating the Perivolos wall close to the old temple area. What they discovered were not archaic remains, but actually stretches of, of a late Mycenaean house. This is what they uncovered during the first season. Now, they didn't come to the sanctuary with the intention of exploring Mycenaean settlement. So they documented the, the structure in this trench and backfilled it again. But what they could conclude was that these were late Helladic 3C remains of an unknown extent of the settlement. So you see these small stretches of walls up here to the west of the Peribolos wall. Some year later, during the new program that has been, well, been working on in the sanctuary for the past six years, the crew found a stray find in area H up here, which we will return to later, but I will tell you already now that it was a, a bronze figurine, a late Bronze Age figurine of, this, of a so-called Reshef type, a smiting god, probably a Levantine import, dating to, to the uh, last years of the late Bronze Age. And that was basically it what was known about Mycenaean remains in this area until 2011 when we returned to this area. Since the old trench had been backfilled, it was, couldn't see anything of the old remains. And we, but we had the coordinates, of course, very precise ones, where we knew where to locate the old trench. And we started by remove, to, by removing the backfill from the 1997 trench. And you see work going on here in, in taking that out. It was rather quick, of course. But we want, we, in the end we wanted to carefully remove, you know, the lost, the lost earth of the backfill so that it wasn't contaminated as we, as we moved along. When we have removed this, uh, this, old, this new earth, we extended the excavation in all areas around this, these walls. Well, not to the east, of course, because there was the temple area. You couldn't go further east. And what we encountered was a fairly simple st uh, stratigraphy in this area. 
we had a modern top surface. Below that, we found an archaic stone packing with some later classical and Hellenistic finds intermixed in this archaic fill, stone packing. And this fill was resting immediately on top of collapsed Mycenaean walls. And on one of these Mycenaean walls, a proto-geometric shirt, one, a single proto-geometric shirt, I will show it later to you, was resting. And there was also, of course, arch uh, archaic shirts there present later. And also pockets of uncontaminated Mycenaean deposits. And below that, there was bedrock. It's probable that we encountered at least one floor deposit and traces of a second. I will show it to you later on. But the conditions when we excavated were rather tricky. As you can see in the image here, it was a lot of stones, of rubble. This archaic stone packing resting immediately on top of the Mycenaean wall, walls which had collapsed. And uh, it was not always easy to distinguish what was what. We had to carefully remove these stones. We believe that this archaic stone packing is actually um, traces of the, the construction of the archaic Peribolos wall to the, to the east. They were chipping stones in the area. But that's another story. And here you see the ongoing process of, uh, of uh, uncovering this, this structure with all these fallen stones in the area. Let me speak a little bit about the documentation in this process. Um, we divide the area into different blocks. That is uh, a number of square meters or whatever unit that suits your purposes best. And we measure them, we've measured them with a total station, the top and the bottom of each block. We also have a grid of square meter units extending over the whole sanctuary which we use when we do soil samples to refer to individual square meter units and sometimes areas within those square meter units. So um, you have control of what you're doing. And we have also taken, I would say, almost an unnecessary large amount of points with our <laughs> told stations in order to map these different blocks in three dimensions. So what you see here is just an example of some, some of these blocks and the walls that we uncovered. We had several uh, participants uh, devoting the whole of the two seasons just to, to record these walls with total stations and then with the addition of uh, tower photography we are able to uh, get a pretty good control of the fine circumstances. I mentioned that we did soil samples from this excavation. I think we did 16 from the Mycenaean area. I will return to it later. For water sieving and dry sieving. And I include those results which we will return to later on in the talk here. In order to prevent the remains from falling apart in the winter rains of between two, 2011 and two, 2012, we built a protective shelter over the remains, which was really good. Um, it saved, saved us a lot of work afterwards in cleaning and uh, I'm glad we did that. And also, since these remains are immediately adjacent to the uh, archaic Peribolos wall and the temple area, in order to retain these remains, you see there's a 
large difference in height. Here are the Mycenaean remains, and here at the lower level are the archaic temple area. In order to retain these Mycenaean remains, we had to stabilize the Peribolos wall and restore it also. And after the excavation, we did a partial backfill. We stabilized the Mycenaean walls and brought in new sand, top sand, for in the area. So it looks, it looks nice now, I would say. So these are, I mean, the general outline of, of the excavation procedure. And now I want to dive into some aspects of, of the finds that we made during these two years. First of all, to the disentanglement of the different faces here. What is archaic? What is Mycenaean? The chronology for the Mycenaean remains. And the extent of this, let's call it a settlement for now, uh, it, within the sanctuary. And we'll also have a look at the traces of the subsistence economy what we've retrieved in our uh, soil samples, and also what the bone and pottery material can tell us. I want to have a quick glance at different levels in their contact networks within and beyond the island, out into the wider region. And finally, it's hard to avoid to at least briefly mention um, different dimensions relating to, to the activities going on in this area since it's located in a later sanctuary. When we excavated the pottery, especially in the transition between the archaic stone packing and the Mycenaean collapsed walls, it was very difficult to determine which context should be considered belonging rather to the Mycenaean period or and which are, are archaic context. So I have tried to, to create what I've called an intrusion index for different deposits within this area. It's not actually very difficult. It's just weights and numbers of Mycenaean and archaic shirts and their relation in different deposits. But that allowed me eventually to sort out which contexts should be included in the discussion of the Mycenaean remains and which should not. You see here those with a high intrusion index, those deposits are slightly less reliable than those with a low intrusion index. But nevertheless, all these contexts I have considered to be useful in, in the analysis of the Mycenaean remains. I have removed here the archaic component from, from the analysis. And since we kept pretty good control of, of, the, of the volumes of earth we removed in each block, had three-dimensional uh, three models of them, it was possible to calculate the ratio between the soil removed and the density of fines within these blocks. And with this you can create something you, you could call an activity or discard index for these various uh, deposits. So basically a high pottery index are blocks with large number of finds in them, regardless of the size of the block, so to say. And that leaves us with three apparent concentrations of finds within this area. This, I, I am not entirely clear the reason for this, but this is what the result, the result you get. Uh, in this area. And, well, let's start actually here. Let me ask you, what is indoor and what is outdoor here? 
<laughs> that was one of the reasons why I started doing this. I, I thought, hmm, could you investigate the, the, the breakage pattern of the shirts and, and let that lead you in a discussion of what is actually indoor or outdoor. Of course, this, I don't think that anyone doubts that these are all indoor rooms, but what is this, this area here? And what is this area? And this area here? I won't give you a clear answer here now. I need to think about it more. So when it comes to the chronology, we will return to pottery, more pottery later on. Um, there is one annoying late Hellenic 3B stem from the Sigurias Kilix. There are a handful of possible late Hellenic 3B2 shirts. The majority of the shirts are of early, late, <laughs> late Hellenic 3C date. There are possibly a few 3C middle shirts. There is one base, as I said, from a proto-geometric skyphos. It's later, resting on a wall foundation. We haven't done any uh, radiocarbon dates on uh, organic material from this excavation simply because I don't think it would be worthwhile. Uh, there are intrusive roots going all the way down to bedrock and um, I think that we would be wasting our money simply by doing this. We think it's possible to distinguish two phases in the construction of, this, of these remains. The first phase is the building of this structure. And the second is this addition. All these walls are nicely bound together in the corners, except in this area here. Here the stones do not bind and you also see that there is a slight shift in the, in the placement of this wall in relation to this one. So our architect, Yari Pakanan, he is fairly confident when he says that this is a later addition. It includes this platform you see here. That's the platform in this corner here. The time that has elapsed between these different phases are, is unknown. We don't know how much time separate the two phases. I think they were built pretty rapidly after each other. But it isn't possible, at least in the pottery material, to see any difference here. I have speculated in the possibility that during the first phase, this was used as an entrance here, based on this block here, which I believe could be, a, well, I'm fairly certain it's a threshold block. But on the other hand, I am less certain if it's a mm. threshold block in situ or if it has been reused. Because as several of my colleagues has pointed out, this is a very awkward place to put a door neck immediately adjacent to this wall here. But you see the block here? And it has been closed off at the later point, perhaps, with these walls resting on top of it. So, if we now come to the end of this, the abandonment of this place, here you see this proto-geometric Skiffos base in situ and a blow up of it. 
This means, I think, that this structure was lying in ruins in the 10th century. It had collapsed by then. And how was this place abandoned? Under what circumstances? Well, we don't know. But let's speculate a little bit. Our archaeobotanist says that in most dis destruction horizons where burning has been going on, there's a lot of carbonized seed remains. We have very low uh, numbers of carbonized seeds in this area, which I think can, uh, excludes the possibility of this place burning. We have some interesting metal finds we, which we can return to later on also. But in this context, they suggest that people were either very <coughs> clumsy and careless and didn't care about these items, or that they left in a ha haste. I don't know. The walls, and I'm sure there are someone in here who knows this, this much better than I, the walls, I have speculated, could perhaps have collapsed in in instantaneously rather than slowly over the years. If you look at this wall here, the bending of, of, of this stretch here, you see the blocks have fallen towards the east and it must have been some kind of great pressure somehow. If this was an instantaneous event, well, an earthquake could possibly be the cause. As I said, I'm just speculating now. I will take this opportunity to ventilate some of my ideas here, and you can say you're flatly, you're wrong, Michael. So, a tentative interpretation. I think we have a colonization in 3C early with a ceramic assemblage that contained a few vessels of older date than the majority. I agree that that late Atlantic 3B1 piece is annoying. But archaeology is always like this, isn't it? There was the construction of, building, of the building, building or buildings in two recognizable phases and an occupation in 3C early and possibly 3C middle. I guess that leaves us with two to three generations or approximately 75 years. Probably a quick abandonment, possibly due to an earthquake. So that's the time frame what we're, that we're dealing with here. Now, let's move on to the extent of this, of this prehistoric habitat. Here is a, a, a digital model of the Mycenaean remains adjacent to the archaic, much later Peribolos wall. You see here also the reason why the Mycenaean remains have been preserved in precisely this area. They are resting in a pocket just above the natural bedrock in this area. When people came to this place in the archaic period and started, well, they had been here before. They had been here at least since geometric times. But when they decided in archaic times to build, to build a temple here, they, uh, they leveled this area uh, completely. They removed a lot of material. And by this, I think, they more or less obliterated all the remains of the Mycenaean uh, structures, which must have been visible in the area when they, when they came here, since the archaic debris is resting immediately on top of, of the Mycenaean stuff. So if I may back 
I'm sorry, but I want to go back to the overview of the of the temple area. Ah, oh, we can use this one. So when Vida and Chelbe found some Mycenaean remains here, and when uh, the crew found this Reshev figurine in this area uh, later on, it kind of suggests to me that this, this portion extended originally eastward, but that it was more, well, all of it was removed when they constructed the temple. And all that we have left are those small stretches there left. Here are uh, those trenches within the sanctuary where we have dug down to bedrock uh, and investigated. There are, Arto kindly reminded me, actually, a few Mycenaean, late Mycenaean sherds from additional areas. Do you remember Arto right off from where they come? Underneath building D. Underneath building D. No, oh, okay. Okay, um, but nowhere else we found uh, architectural remains. There are there are a, a couple of sherds, but no architecture anywhere else inside this area. This suggests to me that we have pretty much covered uh, what is left, at least of the architecture from the Mycenaean period within the sanctuary. And that felt kind of nice, going back to Sweden, saying, it's done. How often can you say that? <laughs> uh, well, we don't know, of course. There might be additional finds in, in, in the area. So if we, now, if we have the time and the extent of this place, if we look in a wider context, this situates the, uh, the finds on Calabria in the larger seascape, let's call it, in the Saronic Gulf, uh, at the turn of the, to the late, to the early iron, uh, at the turn between 3B and 3C, uh, with other settlements. Uh, some are slightly earlier here. Magula, for instance, slightly, but I, I think it could extend into this period as well. We have Kanakia on Usolamis, Kalamianos, uh, which Thomas Tartaron and Daniel Poulin have so successfully documented. Walter Gauss knows that the ceramic sequence at Colonna at least extends into 3C early. We have stray finds up at Mount Oros, and we have excavations at Las Arides. We have the Mycenaean sanctuary at Ayos Constantinos, excavated by Eleni Konsulaki, and her excavations on Modi as well. And actually, when you're standing here, you have an excellent view towards Ayos Constantinos and Mount Oros, at least. I don't know. Uh, I haven't investigated sight lines to. to to Lazaridas, and I guess it would be impossible to see Kanakia. But of course, there was a lot of ships coming and going in these waters in the late Bronze Age, and this, is, this was just one of several excellent spots to, to keep track of this, in this larger sea landscape or seascape. Okay, let's move on to the faunal remains. Subsistence and economy. We retrieved uh, during excavation a little bit more than 1,300 bone specimens, <laughs> of which only 236 could be identifiable. The reason for this is, of course, that we find, found a lot of bone splinters in our soil samples. Really tiny fragments. The, we have the usual domesticates in this assemblage. Cattle, pig, sheep, goat, two dogs, one adult and one puppy. 
and some deer, which is interesting since it shows that there's a component of hunting econ economy also involved here. Sheep and goat predominate completely with uh, roughly 70% uh, of the total. There was also one bird bone and three fish bones tested. Most of these bones derive from this area here. As I said, we took 16 soil samples and water flotated 243 liters. In those samples, we recovered seed remains from area two, three, two, three, and seven. And no surprises really, we found olives, almond, grape, oat, barley, and some cereals. As I pointed out earlier, absence of burnt crop storage suggests that the abandonment of this place was not characterized by a conflagration, fire. I have never excavated a late Mycenaean context before, but I was surprised of the scarcity of lithic remains Really, we only found like five obsidian fragments, two blades and, and two uh, flakes, and a few shirt fragments. Nothing more. I thought there was going to be more. You recognize this. We have the usual andesite grinding stones from the late Bronze Age, or they look the same also in the Middle Bronze Age, of course. We have here some stone spindle whorls or stone buttons. I mean, the function of these are not quite clear in the area. Among the pottery, open shapes predominate. And I think that there are only amphoras among, which I can, could identify positively among the closed shapes. We have rims and legs from at least four cooking jars and tripods. And three pithoi. I haven't included those. And you see, yeah, well, you, you see this deep bowls here. You see uh, closed shaped narrow neck jars, probably amphorae. You have basins and you have cups and dippers. I must say that the, frag the pottery is very fragmentary. It is encrusted also, which makes it difficult to see the decoration. Uh, the paint has faded or worn off, so often it's even impossible to d distinguish monochrome painted or banded specimens on the, the painted pottery. So really, the, the material doesn't lend itself very well to detailed analysis. I'm saying that as a defense, since we have <coughs> so many persons here who knows this pottery much better than I do. Hmm? Local, intra-regional and trans-regional contexts. I don't know if it's possible to speak about a local potting industry or here. <laughs> I mean, this is... Who knows where they got the pottery from in all instances. But there is a category of pottery which I guess most of us would call local in this assemblage. It's a dark surface, medium tempered fabric, um, both handmade and wheel made. 
this pottery. And actually, there's also handmade and burnished pottery. These might come in shapes which some of you are not familiar with. I mean, um, handmade and burnished pottery from late Hellenic 3C context is something special. But I'm telling you, this, they are handmade and they are burnished. I mean, they are. <laughs> and then we have several pieces of pottery from which we believe come from Egina, um, together with Walter Gauss, Vangelia Kiriatsi, and Bartek Lies. I'm doing, we're doing petrography on these shirts, together with pottery from other places, to trace the Egenitan pottery industry after, uh, well, during the Mycenaean period and the early Iron Age. And we've included these these shirts, among others. And although we haven't done chemical analysis so far on the pattern painted Mycenaean decorated pottery, I'm sure, I feel confident that at least some of them derive from the Northeast Peloponnese as a sign of exchange networks within this region. And now, here, <laughs> Here's a jump further east to, to Syria or the Levant. This Reshev figure found in a secondary context, unfortunately, published by Berit Wells. But when we're speaking about context, I guess it's appropriate to, to mention this piece as well. Ah, here are some parallels for you, by the way. Okay, so finally, let's talk a little bit about the activities going on in this area during the late Bronze Age. <clears throat> As I write here, the location of the remains inside a later sanctuary in inevitably invites to speculations on the nature of Mycenaean activities in the area. What were they doing there? Kjellberg and Wiede, when they discovered the, the Mycenaean remains, they saw it as uh, proof of the Calabrian and Fictioni, do you pronounce it like that? Going back to the late Bronze Age, this league of city-states uh, with the seats on Poros. They mentioned that in the, the, their report. Kelly, in 1966, he wrote that no, no, no. What Chelbey and Vide found were just some stray finds from Mycenaean chamber tombs disturbed tombs in the area, nothing else. But I think we can prove Kelly wrong at least now. Berit Wells and Arto, uh, when they published the remains of the 1997 excavation immediately west of the Peribolos, um, didn't venture too much into the function of this area, but Berit Wells mentioned that they found an area around a very large stone block which contained a lar very large amount of bones and pottery in, in a context which possibly could indicate some kind of, let's call it, ritual activity. Robin Hegg in 2003 Return to the Mycenaean founds, finds known at that time and suggested that there might have been a Mycenaean sanctuary in the area. At least the finds done so far would equally well be, pres be found in a sanctuary context rather than a settlement context. So, 
Okay, if we look at equipment or installations that might possibly lead our thoughts in the way to cultic or religious behavior, I guess these two miniature bronze double axes which we found are good to mention. They are very small. And you see they are pierced here. I guess you can either hang them on a string or put them on a small stick. I don't know. We have these gold discs which Kjellberg uh, and Wiede also found on the eastern side of the temple area. It must be the same stuff, really. They don't provide it a picture, an image of, of them, but from the, the, their description it must be discs like this. There are parallels of, of these discs, especially from the Sharps graves at Mycenae, uh, obviously very much earlier. And I think that most people would agree that these have been fastened to textiles somehow. Or worn in jewelry. We also found a few figurines, not many. A few animal figurines and part of one female figurine uh, in the area as well. And we have these stone buttons. I mean, these actually these are found in the in the sanctuary at Philippi. But they are, of course, equally well placed in an ordinary settlement context. Really, like I would say, most of the other finds as well. Well, the drinking vessels will skip. But also, we have this built platform in this in the corner of this, uh, let's call it area, not room. As I write here, I don't know, except possibly for the rare ship figure. All of these items could equally well belong in a settlement context, I would argue. So. But at least I've touched upon the question now, because I know that you would have asked me otherwise afterwards. I don't know. What do you think? And with that, I'll leave you. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. And I will try to answer any questions you might have to the best of my ability. I don't know. So thank you, Mikke. So please. Questions. We have first to thank you for a very detailed presentation. These are not very well known. And uh, as you said, there is a free Hellatic, late Hellatic three sea settlement. We have no previous habitation on the rock. That's right? Yes, that's true. And there is continue, continuous habitation after that. There is a 10th century Skiffus base. And then there is. Hmm? Good there question. There's no gap between mm -hmm. the settlement and the uh, temple. No. There are, um, good question. There are a few, actually, uh, there might be a few late Mycenaean 3C, late sherds from the bottom of one trench. I didn't include them here. It mm -hmm. reminded me of them. There's this proto geometric Skiffos base. Mm -hmm. There are some middle geometric. Uh, pottery. Um, and the first architecture we see, how old is that after the Mycenaean? Could it possibly be uh, geometric architecture art or is it early archaic? Mid 8th century. 
But it's not a, the temples, uh, not yet. Oh, yeah. More, more yes. So yeah, yeah. There are th there's intermittent activity in the area mm -hmm. after the Mycenaean structure is abandoned. I would say. The nature of that presence and duration is. We can't say very much about. I have another question about the finds that are spectacular for a late Hellenic three C settlement. Can you came to think if there could be hell rooms to the later temple. I don't know. Well, the gold foil could be easily ge be geometric. Mm -hmm. The Recep, well, mm -hmm. as far as we know, is 12th century, and there is a little, at least one in Philacopi, uh -huh. in a Mycenaean uh, sanctuary. Uh -huh. okay, the you. others are from Mycenaean Tiris, Sleeman's finds. Mm -hmm. We don't know exactly the finds, but... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are some. Uh -huh. And uh, the double eggs, I'm thinking if they could be later or be in hell rooms. Usually there are seals that are found in later temples. But it's very uh -huh. exciting. So you mean you're suggesting I'm possibly suggesting that the double axis might have been put, uh, manufactured earlier, but earlier, used. but you find it in an mm. archaic deposit. <laughs> Let's say. Mm -hmm. now, you're, well, these two double axes were certainly in a very good late Hellenic 3C context. Mm. They are. So they are in excellent. So are yes, they are. I mean, they are not mm -hmm. in very good context. Actually, so, so actually, one of the double axes was found below a fallen block, Mycenaean mm -hmm. block, in this corner. So uh, you are so plop. It remains very impressive. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I want to ask you if you have concluded anything, anything about the architecture. I see there a narrow corridor. Is this a room or it could be a staircase? Let us move uh, back. In this case, Which area were you thinking about especially? Oh, yeah, this was, uh, that I show in the photograph. I think ah. this is there. At, uh, to the Let us move. Yes, you mean here. this, this yes. area here? Yes. Aha, yes. This, this is the archaic Peribolos wall. Oh, yes. Mm. So you see, you see how the Mycenaean remains goes all the way up to the archaic stuff. So this is, you have to think this, this away completely. Uh, I am also surprised because there are finds that are inside the building and outside. And many of them are outside. It yes. means that they have fallen from a, a high, from a high level. In this case, if we have a second floor, mm -hmm. a first floor. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's back. Let's take uh, this, this, yes, this for figurines and the gold uh, uh, foils. Okay, but aren't people also just careless and drop things outdoors? Uh, I don't think that people have dropped things there. Uh -huh. These have been. Uh, uh, the, these are the, come from the destruction, possibly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't so, know, of course. Okay, so it's a second a story. Yes. A second story. Yes. And another question that I have to ask you is about dogs. Mm -hmm. You have uh, bones of dogs. Mm -hmm. These are dogs uh, between the other bones. Mm -hmm. These are from the consumption for, for food or um, just the uh, <laughs> guards? Yes. Uh, this is a contested issue, as you know. Did, they eat, did people eat dog in the, during the late Bronze Age? Um, well, I personally think that they did, um, but um, I, you cannot tell from the deposit. We know that the dogs ate on those, the other bones because we have lots of gnaw marks from, from dogs eating on other bones, but these particular dog bones, they are non-conclusive. They're just there. But I'm, I'm actually, I'm, I'm in another project, I'm, 
I'm looking at the remains from the Shoth graves at Lerna, from the fills, which I interpret some, as two very large feasting deposits. And there, for certainly, they, th there are dog bones, and I think they ate them. I did. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, you mentioned uh, the archaic temple was built down and the Mycenaean stuff was cleared away, right? Mm -hmm. Where is it? The Mycenaean stuff? All ah. the stuff they moved, where are, the, where are yes, they gone? Yes, did, yes, did you yes. Look? Some of it ended up in the fields that uh, was excavated by, by Wiedel Schellberg, but not, of course, the stone remains. But I don't know. Maybe they threw them, just leveled it over the, um, the edge of the... Of the temple area because What's it's um, so I don't I'm not quite sure if the, is it you're not on the sea though are you no so no. could you I mean yes. have you looked below yes let us move back to another I will actually do like this but that is a good question Penelope Uh, hmm. uh, you can't see it very clearly here, but this, the, the ground is sloping very dramatically along this edge here. Um, and I guess, well, I have actually, I have to confess, I haven't thought that much about it, but when they leveled this area that they just tipped it, it tipped over. It over. Yeah. So it might be worth investigating this area below. Yeah, but it, it's cultivated, isn't it? Yes, is that an and it, it's not expropriated, is it, very no. far? Some of it, some of it is. Look, you, you'd have to, I mean, there's not going to be anything on the surface then, probably. It I is, mean, the vegetation is so thick in that yeah. area, but hmm, maybe one should go you around could have there a and have a poke <laughs> and look. There, there is a nice guy. Yes, but I'm thinking about the large blocks. Maybe they reused the, the Mycenaean blocks in the, I don't know, cut them and used them in the archaic Peribolos wall. Who knows? I'm more of that pottery. Aha, ah, yes, oh yes, you want more of that, yes. Does it look 3 C early? It does? <laughs> yeah. Yes, mm, I've saved those for another day. Oh, yeah. yeah, I wanted to back up again on Penelope's question also. Um, the three sea settlement you were talking about that might have been cleared away by the archaic temple is approximately 50 by 20 meters, something like that. Yeah. So how many shirts did you find in your excavation? Something like 1,000? Yeah, two or three, I think. Yeah. Mm. So I think you really need to find tens of thousands of shirts and not only two or three figurines east and north of the temple. So if, if the archaic temple builders cleared away basically an entire Mycenaean settlement right. of a 50 years lifetime, you really need to think of tens of thousands or even 100,000 yes. shirts. Yeah. And this is what puzzles me a bit if you have so few straight Mycenaean straight finds. Yes. Around. Let's have a look here on this image. You know, maybe, maybe it was just a house here. It might not have been more than this. Okay. Who there, knows? There are Mycenaean spindle walls in building I, outside the um, sanctuary. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and they were probably reused mm -hmm. in a Hellenistic context. Mm -hmm. So they were probably picking those things up and what mm -hmm. they found useful, they used. Mm -hmm. When, when, I, when I started working here with the Mycenaean remains, I had been with Walter at Colonna, where the strength, I mean, the, you have a later temple there resting on a prehistoric settlement, and you know immediately that this is a prehistoric settlement. It's everywhere, pottery, everywhere. Uh, but that is not the case here. It's rather sparsely dis distributed in this, in this sanctuary. So I don't, it's, it, 
I think it was a rather small settlement and short-lived. Mm -hmm. But still you would find more pottery. You would need to find more pottery. Yeah. Uh, may I ask, doesn't it puzzle you that you did find so few fish bones if you think of interconnection by ships? I don't know the, uh, how, actually how fish bones are preserved, how well they are pres preserved under what circumstances. It's true, we, we found very few of them. And yes, that is kind of surprising, I would say. It is. Um, Yes. No, no, I don't, I don't, doubt, I don't doubt that you missed it. I just mm -hmm. had you did flotation and you did sipping. So it really is a surprising result mm -hmm. that basically an island or and a settlement close to the sea produces only so few fish. Yes, yes. And still, we, I mean, Dimitra Milona is on our team and she is really careful about fish bones, let me tell you. Um, yes. For, for example, the, uh, the area from say, the, the site of Ascalio at Kerr, it's broad in the middle of the city. We don't have this boat at all. We have, I think, one just to, to have the, the fish boat. We didn't have any. Mm -hmm. We have and we had animal boats itself, mm -hmm. but not fish boats. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't mean that, I mean, it doesn't mean because it's close to the sea. Mm -hmm. They're exploiting fish all the time. Yeah. yeah. And the second question was the earthquake. Good, Walter, thank you for that observation, because when I was sitting at the at terrace this, today, preparing this PowerPoint, I thought, hmm, maybe it was an earthquake. Let's toss that one in. But no, you're right, there should be complete mandible pots, of course. So let's scratch that. And finally, why did they remove so much soil to, uh, and cut down into the bedrock to, to build the temple? Yari Pakanen is our architect, and I, I don't know really how much material you have to remove for the substructure for Greek temples, but it, it is a lot. I, I, I simply can't answer why they felt it necessary to go that deep. Um, maybe someone else is better equipped to answer that. But it's on, now it's on foundation level. The foundation stones have been taken out, so it's not the floor level of the temple. Yes, no, yes, the temple has been completely ripped out. Including the foundation. Yes, I mean, we're at, at the absolute bottom of what they dug out, so it isn't like this is the temple floor here. It's, you know, it's all the stones are incorporated into later houses, in Hydra and other places. Mm, no, I, I'm sorry, I, I'm very bad at temple building. Okay. Am I am I off the hook? So we have to continue the discussion over the glass of wine. Okay. Thank you.